All right, well, hey, we are here with our Sermon Recap Podcast. I am the poor man's David Barrett filling in for him. I think he's enjoying some time with his family. But we have Dave Rhodes here all the way through the internet in Atlanta, Georgia. Dave, how are you, man? Hey, everyone. Good to uh, be with you, Pierce, and uh, doing well. I was on a 3.30 wake-up call from San Francisco today, early flight, so I'm not really sure where I'm at, but that's all right. Man, you were at that place where you're just getting all those delta miles so just you know that's that's the silver side of it that's the 330 side (laughs) (laughs) yeah i guess so um well man hey uh thank you again we we have been so blessed just by you you being with us and um particularly sharing on self-control and so as we do we we give uh sort of our congregation the opportunity to ask some questions and so i'm just gonna start off uh with one of the questions we got and the first one is, if self-control is a fruit and we can't bear it ourselves, you know, that's uh, John 15 and, and you mentioned that, but but then what is our role in self-control? Yeah, I, I mean, it's called self-control, right? <laughs> right, it does I mean, seem it, like it, we have a it, role. <laughs> right. Uh, God it, control. You know, it, right, yeah, <laughs> I mean... Well, with everything in faith, God's the initiator of things. He's the one um, who produces the fruit. The Spirit of God produces the fruit in us. Uh, But our cooperation has an impact on the way that fruit is produced in us. We can either join with God in what He desires to do, wants to do, or we can get in the way of what God wants to do, um, or just simply ignore it altogether. Um, And so I, I, I I would put our role as cooperation with the Spirit of God, surrendering to what God wants to do and then embracing uh, what God is doing and partnering with him uh, for the creation of those things. Uh, But I think it's important, you know, when Jesus says, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches, apart from me, you can do nothing. We don't actually believe that, right? We always think there's lots of things I can do. Uh, But but, uh, what what he's saying there is anything good that's going to come out of you uh, is going to be initiated by me. And you can either partner with that Um, Again, Jesus' analogy is he's the vine, we're the branches, so there's a partnership between vine and branches, Uh, but the initiator of that is is God himself. Yeah, that's good. And and this might lead into kind of my next question, because I I think you're spot on. Just in our culture today, it's hard to comprehend us not doing something to achieve something in return, right? I mean, we constantly live in a culture in which we always are looking to invest and then receive, invest, receive. Yet, like you said, that's the antithesis. That's the opposite of the gospel. The gospel is that we have been given, right? We don't, we don't put in effort. We don't bear fruit ourselves, but instead the fruit comes through obedience in the spirit. And so it kind of leaves us almost feeling like we're just twiddling our thumbs in a way, and and that doesn't seem to work out in how our society is structured. And yet, I think self-control is uniquely challenging in 2023. And I don't know if it's social media, I don't know if it's the age of the internet and accessibility, but what do you think, or are there any unique challenges to self-control, particularly in our culture or in our, you know, age of 2023? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I actually like the translation of self-mastery mm. better than self-control. Uh, it's a sense of knowing who God is, knowing who you are, uh, a sense of uh, becoming who God has dreamed you or destined you to be, and the freedom to actually step into that and do that and not sell or for, set, settle for lesser versions of who God has made you to be. And so there's this sense of, uh, I, I, you can think about the Christian life this way, it's about um, uh, learning more and more about who God is, learning more and more about who I am, so I can surrender more and more of who I am to more and more of who God is. Uh, One Presbyterian pastor said it this way, he said, you can only surrender as much as you know about yourself to as much as you know about God. So it's that ongoing discipline. And and I think, you know, discipline is part of the Christian life. You can't actually even think about discipleship without discipline. That is, I mean, they come from the same idea. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't have any control of my natural born talent as an athlete, but I can discipline that talent mm-hmm. in a way that uh, matures it in a way that uh, takes advantage of what I was created with. So we don't get a chance to, to do the creation, but we do get a chance to do the partnership. 
And discipline's part of that whole thing. And unfortunately, discipline's been one of those things that's left out of uh, our understanding of freedom today. We think freedom's the ability to do anything you want to do versus the capability to become who God's always created you to be. And so we in our society have um, somehow manufactured a false freedom that doesn't require discipline. And I think that would be foreign to the world of the Bible or to the thoughts of Jesus on what true freedom actually looks like. And not only that, we've gone a little bit further in our society, um, and we've made outrage the new rage. I mean, I wrote an article probably two years ago, like, don't make outrage the next rage. Um, and so everyone's outraged about something, and it's almost uh, we glorify being out of control um, or we glorify this sense of outrage. And there are things to be outraged about, so I don't want to, you know, Sure. neglect that there are some things that but but you can't be outraged about everything all the time uh and somehow we've made that normal we've called that freedom yeah i've I've heard it said that you know in america we always view freedom as a freedom to right so we have a freedom to bear arms we have a freedom to say whatever we want but but biblical freedom is a freedom from right it's a freedom from the bondage of slave and, and that's drastically different and, and both are freedoms both are freedoms i'm sure that you and i are grateful yeah. for but albeit different right and so yeah fr freedom from and i'd say freedom for yeah you know what what are you set free for uh and what are you set free from so we're set free from bondage but we're set free for the good work that god's been in God's imagination from uh, the beginning of time. Yeah, uh, I love that. I love that. Hey, so one of the things that, that we got a question on, and I, I really loved this point, and just the, the way that you brought in the story of Job uh, was, was really, really impactful just to my own listening. But the question is, you know, you talked about consequences and sufferings, and in my notes, you said that consequences is my life falls apart because of a bad decision I made. And then you sort of juxtapose that to suffering, which is my life falls apart despite making good decisions. And so the question yeah. is, why would someone experience suffering because they do something good? Yeah, I mean, so Job sets in the scripture as wisdom literature, as a corrective to what I'm going to give you some big words here. It's called Deuteronomic theology. Deuteronomic theology is basically the idea, if I walk away from God then, you know, I experienced despair and destruction and uh, devastation and death. And we see that from Genesis 3 on. Um, and Deuteronomic theology says, if I walk toward God, then I'm going to gain blessing and, I'm, you know, uh, success and different things like that. And that, that is generally true. That is generally true. So the more that I walk toward God, the more blessed my life, more blessing my life exudes. This is Abrahamic uh, Genesis chapter 12. Um, promise that God that God makes. However, there's always exceptions to the rule. Um, and so what happened in Israel is that people began to reason backward from that Deuteronomic theology. So it was like this. If, if your life's falling apart, it's because you've done something bad. If your, life's falling, if, if your life's going well, it's because you've done something good. So they reasoned backward. Job stands as a contradiction to that necessary one to say, sometimes you follow God and everything falls apart. Mm. Um, and so I, what I was trying to do is to say, you know, uh, when we face circumstances in our life, Sometimes those circumstances are made from my own choosing um, and their consequences that, you know, I, I, I want to do whatever I want, then not suffer any consequences or get God to deliver me from consequences. And the truth is, you know, even as a Christian, when we make that bad decisions, we're going to experience consequences for those things. But sometimes when you follow God, your life gets harder. Sometimes you get poorer. Sometimes you go through difficult kinds of things. The Bible has a term for that. It's called suffering. And so what I was trying to distinguish is um, following God is not a hall pass from experiencing challenges in your life. It's not a hall pass to just say everything's always up and to the right. Sure. Sometimes following God leads you down and to the left. Um, <laughs> and and, and uh, it's not because God's masochistic and he's trying to bring bad things upon you. Uh, but what you'll find is all throughout Scripture, um, those who suffer well come out with a testimony. Um, and they realize some things that God's placed in them that they may not even realize any other way. So what, what I was trying to convey is that God's not 
the cause of our suffering, but he is an opportunist in the middle of our suffering. He will jump in and in the midst of it, and he'll pull things out of us that we didn't know that were there. He'll do things in us that we didn't know he could do, and he'll demonstrate something through us that we would never have imagined. And it's interesting. I've thought about this before. I think anyone would be hard-pressed to find a hero of the faith or a personal hero of the faith, right? Who, who is this most spiritually wise person you know? I think the direct correlation is there's almost always been significant tragedy right. that they've walked yeah. through. It, and it is. It's, it's yeah. a refining process. But it's interesting, talking about self-discipline, like I'll be honest, when I think about um, – sorry – um, self-control. When I think about self-control, I almost always go to cravings, right? Which was one third of sort of the point you made, but I don't often think about self-control in times of suffering, right? And, And so why do you think it's, I guess, so important to acknowledge that in times of suffering, we saw this with the life of Job and his, his wife, particularly why it's so important though, to not abandon our faith and to continue to pursue self-control in those situations. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one thing that I was trying to bring out in the message is that pain, like you were talking about, both makes great Christians, followers of God, but it also makes great atheists. Yeah. And, and, and all of that is really determined on our response to the suffering. We live in a broken world. Broken things are going to happen um, in, in the midst of that. We, we, like I said, we don't have a hall pass from experiencing brokenness, um, but we do have a choice in the middle of it. Um, I, I love uh, Philip Yancey has been a, a, a fundamental voice in my mm-hmm. life um, from when I was in college reading his books. And one of the most important books that I, I've read in, in my tenure is Disappointment with God that he wrote. And he deals with the problem of pain. Um, and his, his, his end game is uh, at the end of the book, I don't want to spoil it in case you haven't read it, but the end game is this. Uh, you can either be disappointed with God or you can be disappointed without God. Either way, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> either yeah. way, you're going to experience brokenness. Either way, you're going to experience pain in your life. Um, and authors like him, authors like C.S. Lewis, uh, they have an incredible way of helping us see this as as a gift um, for for what God does in us and, and makes uh, through us. And so for me, it was during one of the most painful seasons of my life that I stepped into the goodness of God. Before that painful moment, I knew that God was right, but I didn't really believe he was good. I thought he was just kind of, you know, arbitrarily right. And my job was to follow him. But I bumped into the goodness of God in one of the most difficult valley moments of my life. And I've never got I've never gotten over that. Yeah, that's like, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Pete Scazzaro and emotional, healthy discipleship. But yeah. he talks about you, you hit the wall, right? And, and everyone yeah. hits the wall. It's inevitable. But your response to the wall right. is where you, you have a, a choice. And, and you yeah. know, you are able to choose self-control or yeah. you can choose total loss of control. And, you know, then that's where yeah. you almost go back into cravings yeah. and, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I was thinking about putting the message together, I was like, all right, when are the times that I lose control of myself? Mm-hmm. One, uh, it's when, you know, I have urges inside of me that I think God's not going to meet that I've got to meet on my own. The other is, you know, when I get into circumstances that make me think bad things about God or bad things about who I am, I have a tendency to, you know, try and, con- you know, control it myself and manufacture and get upset when things don't go the right way. And then the last one uh, was when I get in conflict with other people, you know, on a drive home from Atlanta. I'm like, how can, you know, how can I lose my self mastery in a 45 minute drive <laughs> from the airport? Right. But it happens very easily and very, very quickly. And so I, I was thinking about those things and then, you know, you know, letting the, the Bible inform those things and just seeing those trends all throughout. Well, man, you know, no one ever sins because they just want to choose sin a lot of times. You don't sin till you first dress it up as good. So what makes you dress it up as good? Well, it's when, you know, your cravings or your circumstances or your con- or conflict in your life isn't going the way that you want it to. Then all of a sudden it does something in you uh, that you can either choose to bring to God or you can choose to walk away from God with. Yeah. Man, that's so, so good. <clears throat> Well, Dave, hey, I appreciate you taking time just to continue to just help us be formed in the Spirit of God and and helping us just walk through 
uh, just what it means to be people of self-control and so we love having you uh if you ever want to move to dallas you said it before we started recording our traffic is better um, it is better yeah and we have wonderful summers okay you'll love it you'll love the summers yeah. here if you like hot. your skin to boil <laughs> <laughs> yeah very very hot but it's hot you know it's hot Atlanta. It, that's what it's, we call it hot Atlanta for a reason too so that's true that's true so well then in that case all you're missing is the traffic so come on down yeah <laughs> <laughs> right. well man hey take care and have a good rest of your night and we hope to see you back soon great thanks pierce love always being with you guys great great time there at the heights and uh am so uh, honored to be part of what god's doing there